Welcome to Heartland at Home, aka Live from the Heartland. This is number 27, and we've got a really nice show for you today. I'm Michael James. I'm here with Tom Clark and Katie Hogan, and we're going to bring on Daryl Holiday of the City Bureau, and then Dorian Perry Tillman, a Loyola activist. We're going to have a report from our friend, uh, Mr. Mir, down there in Brazil. And uh, as usual, we like to start off with what's good going on for the, each one of us. So Katie, you're up first. Spill the beans. Uh, I'm back riding my bike to work uh, outside, working outside at Gethsemane Gardens, selling trees and wreaths and boughs. Very, very holiday-ish. So what's yours, Michael? What's your good thing this week? I got two things that have made me happy. Uh, one is I'm getting to watch my son, Hal, uh, work on a film with his friend, Carly, and they've been shooting uh, footage and I helped them get all their equipment to the train station to go up north where they did the first weekend of shooting. And it's great to see him active, uh, making, I think, really a first film. And then I'm real happy that my daughter, Casey Blue, who has been uh, isolated and living it up in her own apartment there in New York has come home for the next seven weeks. Well, we're prepping for one of the smallest Thanksgiving dinners that I can ever remember having since 1971 when I was in Rome and just with classmates. So it's, it's a strange year, I think, for all of us, but I feel very fortunate to be uh, safe and well and uh, in a compatible household that uh, hopefully we'll get through the holidays in pretty decent shape. So uh, before we get through the holidays, our head must explode. Every week we must explode our heads. What was it this week, Tom? Well, as you get ready for your holiday shopping, won't you be glad to know that you can get stuff made in Israel, officially from Palestinian <laughs> lands, thanks to our outgoing Secretary of State making a pompous ass of himself once again by declaring all this good stuff going on in Israel these days while Palestinian rights are trampled left and right. I'm just, you know, this 60 days of waiting for the new regime to come in to replace the old regime is just gonna be taxing, I think, on body and soul. But um, it's important we pay attention to this stuff as we're going along. Um, meanwhile, back on the home front while we wait for the official certification to happen, we want to acknowledge um, some of the impacts um, that Native Americans have had in what the outcome has been. Michael? Well, both in Arizona and Nevada, Wisconsin, and a lot of other places, Native American communities turned out in mass in support of uh, the president-elect Joe Biden. What blew my mind and or exploded my head was watching Democracy Now!, and you'll all remember the Dakota Access Pipeline demonstrations and the Standing Rock Sioux. The sister of the chief was on Democracy Now! And she reported on when the COVID, when the COVID hit on the res, people uh, blocked the roads for people to keep people from coming in. If they were just passing through, they let them. If they were going to stay, they got details and their plans. Guess who took away their money and tried to mess them up? You know, the bully boy, whatever mm -hmm. you want to call him, the ex-president to be. It, uh, I'm, really, uh, I'm really impressed and happy that the Native American communities around the country turned out and uh, that they took measures to deal with COVID, even if they got hit in the face for it. Yeah, actually, I think line five up in Michigan got uh, turned down just uh, this past week, um, which was one of the many... Uh, pipelines that people were demonstrating against continuing uh, to the uh, construction of. And that was another thing from that nasty woman in Michigan, I think. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, anyway, back to, uh, back to ground here. Um, of course, COVID, we've got the highest numbers yet um, in, in, in the world. The US is number one in the world with COVID. Um, Thanksgiving is out. Um, we crossed over 250, thousand deaths um, just this past week. We do have two promising vaccines, at least uh, uh, getting cranked out and on the horizon, but we still have a GSA head who is holding up transition money and access needed for any hope of a smooth transition. Um, let's see, 
Her name is Emily Murphy, a nice Irish girl like myself. Oh, those Irish girls in government. And we do have her phone number. Uh, I think it's available online, but uh, I think if you want to know where to call, uh, the main number is 844-872-4681. And that is the General Services Administration, and they are uh, being a thorn in our sides right now. So, yeah, I'm sure you can find it somewhere there else. There is too. a silver lining of sorts in the midst of the, all the COVID stuff, which is that U.S. greenhouse gas emissions are down to one of those lowest levels in three decades. Of course, it's largely because we're not driving, but it may be one of those things we don't want to return to normal about. And it would be a really interesting way to perhaps meet those carbon goals if we, you know, locked in this 9% reduction we're looking at right now and made it more permanent. Wouldn't that be something? I think that's very, very interesting that, that actually COVID is, is keeping us on track for the Paris Accords when, <laughs> you know, who pulled us out and then gave us uh, the biggest COVID in the world. Thanks, Donald. Seriously, folks, stay home, get things delivered to you. Tell your kids you'll see them in 2021. Wash hands, wear masks, keep your distance, and try and find some joy in the simple things like a walk in the neighborhood, a living room workout, some art, some music. We'll get through this. Uh, Brazil has the second highest rate of COVID infection, second only to the U.S. And um, what caught my attention the other day, I was reading an art, we're not gonna give a COVID report from Brazil, but we do have some political information. I was reading the Guardian and there was a report that I heard nowhere else that there had been elections in Brazil last weekend, predicted to really uh, be a success for the right wing and the left was supposed to be decimated. I read a report how the left in the center swept all the local elections everywhere in Brazil. And we have a friend down there, uh, Brian Meir, who uh, is an expat and has been down there and has uh, interviewed Lula. Uh, he's a real active journalist. Kate, you know him better than I do. Tell us a little bit about Brian. Well, uh, just briefly, Brian is the eldest son of Rob Meir, who many people remember was the Economic Development Commissioner under uh, Harold Washington, a guy who really loved the city and helped uh, steer the, the ship of this particular state, the Chicago state, um, away from uh, you know government for the 1%. Uh, they were attempting to do a lot of things differently. And you know who knows, had Washington lived, we, we might, have, uh, might have been looking at very different uh, neighborhoods at this point. But anyway, he uh, trained his son well. His son went down to uh, Brazil some years ago now which is why we call him an expat. He's got a family down in Sao Paulo and, uh, and he's uh, multilingual. Yay, bri bri. I remember him when he was a kid. So we, can... uh, we got a hold of Brian and we said, how about a couple of minutes on the elections? And Bolsonaro is another neo-fascist kind of a guy. Uh, and uh, I'd had won the election down there and was touted as going to win a lot of local elections. And what Brian is going to report to us now is how local elections throughout the land uh, went to the, didn't go to Bolsonaro, went to the center and to the left. So let's take it away, Brian Meir. On Sunday, over 147 million Brazilians went out to vote for candidates for city council and mayor, and the government's electoral court tallied the entire count by midnight last night. All the results are out, and it looks like the big loser is the coalition around far-right President Jair Bolsonaro. The big winner of yesterday were the traditional center-right coalitions, which have been dominating Brazilian politics for the last 500 years, tied to the rural lobby, the agribusiness lobby. But the left held strong and even made gains in some points. The Brazilian left has never controlled anywhere near a majority of local governments in Brazil. But in 2016, the PT party only made it to one final round election in any of Brazil's top 96 cities. Today, the PT is facing off in 15. So it's made gains in the largest and richest cities in Brazil. In all, leftist candidates won 898 mayor's offices yesterday. 
and 10 more of them will face off for control of the nation's 26 capital cities. The two largest left parties in Brazil in terms of local governments historically have been the center-left Democratic Workers' Party, PDT, and the Brazilian Socialist Party, PSB, which is a bit inaptly named because it's center-left. They continue controlling the highest numbers of mayor's offices. The Brazilian Workers' Party won 189 mayor's offices yesterday and is in the running for 15 more. The Communist Party of Brazil won 40 46 mayor's offices and is going to the final round in Porto Alegre in coalition with the PT. And the tiny Socialism and Liberty Party, PSOL, which has a long history of punching above its weight, doubled its number of mayor's offices from two to five, but has made the final round in the Sao Paulo election. So in all, it was a big loss for Bolsonaro, big gains for the center-right, and moderate gains for the Brazilian left parties in this year's municipal elections. Cool. Well, you know, when Brian says something is center right, it's probably just center. (laughs) But right on, Brian. Keep it keep it real, my brother. And we'll be looking forward to talking to you more about what goes on in Brazil, one of our sister countries to the south. So are we going to talk about state or should we just listen to some music and bring our guest in? Well, since you teased us with the state, let's just say that the cannabis licenses have been delayed again to the spring amidst the flurry of lawsuits as predicted recently by our guest and our state rep, Kelly Cassidy. Uh, There are more indictments in uh, Speaker Madigan's comment bribery scandal on the way. And the then president of the city club charged with funneling bribes from former Exelon CEO to lobbyists seeking favorable treatment on rates and new plant subsidies from the speaker. There's more. <laughs> I'm sure we'll, we'll keep reporting on it too. The, um, the exploits of the speaker are really on the front page every day in an ongoing story through the holidays. Uh, it, I think, is really why there is not a veto session to clean up some legislative initiatives uh, yes, COVID affected that as well, but uh, the speaker is in a lot of trouble and the state is hurting as a result. So it's a story that's worth watching, but we have to watch about how much we enjoy this or really suffer from it. Uh, we're going to take a musical break and I'd like to just share a little information. We're going to hear from Jimmy Johnson doing Every Day of Your Life. Uh, it's a He's going to sing it with Tiffany Monique uh, and it's from our friends at Delmark Records. Jimmy Johnson is a, a blues man and uh, R&B. Uh, many years ago, I produced a number of events with a group called Cooperative Energy Supply and uh, Rising Up Angry. And uh, Jimmy Johnson was one of the people we got to come do the dance and our good pal, Katie and I, good pal, Mike McGraw of the Piranha Brothers, now living in Hawaii, was uh, the band that uh, backed him up. So we're going to hear from him now. Take it away, Jimmy Johnson, every day of your life.
Now we're joined by my uh, old colleague and dear buddy, Daryl Holliday, one of the more unique journalists in town. I first met Daryl when he was covering the crime and mayhem beat at DNA Info, which has been replaced by the nonprofit Block Club News, um, one of the more important local news outlets. Daryl and his friends on the South Side out of the Invisible Institute went on to found City Bureau, which I can't believe it, Daryl is already celebrating five years. City Bureau was, in its initial idea, something that seemed to me to be an interesting civics project, teaching young youth of the South Side and underreported neighborhoods how to cover meetings, kind of a civics lesson thing with a little bit of civic journalism built in. Oh, you've evolved since then, Daryl. Tell us what City Bureau has been up to and what are some of the exciting projects you're working on right now? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we, we've been busy. I also can't believe it's been five years. We're having our uh, anniversary party December 10th, so that'll be exciting to see everyone together. Um, what have we been doing since, since, since year one? Um, you mentioned Invisible Institute, which was uh, s- sort of our, our, our godfather organization. When I, when I left DNA Info and went to Invisible Institute, Jamie Calvin was really the one who you know, g- gave us a home for a bit to incubate City Bureau while also working with Visible Institute. So the orgs are, are independent and separate, but I'd say we're, we're, we're family. So since then we've developed what, three programs. Uh, like you said, our um, documenters program pays and trains people. At this point, there's what, 2,200 or so people who have accounts on our app and our go to public meetings. The, city council, the police board, all the various advisory councils, subcommittees all the way down and um, make sure that information is available to the public and transparent. Um, the reporting fellowship brings together emerging and experienced reporters and they work together to produce stories in our public newsroom. Our third program is a, a monthly, well now monthly online series of um, workshops, public workshops. So yeah, uh, we're, we're focused on civic engagement, journalism, bringing many, many more people into the journalism industry who are creating, distributing, um, you know, accurate information together. Tell us about what, tell us about one of your big stories this year. Um, uh, stories, stories, yeah, yeah stories. So yeah, one of them that got our attention was the one about mortgage lending patterns in Chicago. Yeah, I think that was definitely one of our biggest ones lately. Uh, we, we worked with WBEZ um, to uh, dig into um, um, bank lending in, in Chicago. Um, and so that, that, that reporting happened in our editorial program, which I do not run. So I'm not gonna presume to have all of the nitty gritty details, but the, the results have been really interesting and really amazing. And um, we've seen uh, lots of work from organizers, activists in the city, uh, we've seen some movement in um, the state Senate. So uh, Senator Collins has been reaching out to us and, and had one of our, our main reporter on to talk to um, the Senate and, and a bunch of bankers about, about <laughs> our reporting. Um, yeah, there's been a lot of movement since then. So that was a series of stories featuring folks who live on the top of the West Side, folks who have um, experience in the banking industry itself. We're able to bring that to the reporting. and. Yeah, we're, we're, we're proud of that work. So growing nonprofit news networks in Chicago, covering neighborhoods um, like downtown papers never have. Um, so that is, was seemingly led by the Chicago Reporter, Lock Club News, Southside Weekly, The Tribe. The reader is now moving more in that direction. I mean, it is in that direction now, not for profit. Um, Invisible Institute, What? who are your readers? Um, at this point, do you know? Uh, yeah, I, I'd say we do know, but I'd also take a step back. Like the, I mean, C- City Bureau is definitely a newsroom, but I'd say we're part newsroom. We're part newsroom, we're part community hub, we're part classroom. Um, we talk about stories a lot and we produce stories, but uh, I, I am far from thinking that stories are the end all be all of what journalists can do. So, you know, I think we do know who our readers are. They're, they're people who are interested in, 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 in civics, they're, they're educators, they're organizers, they're other journalists. But really what we're usually more focused on is this community of practice that we're building. You know, you know, how are we equipping people 
to be news gatherers, not just journalists, but, you know, mothers, students, sons, daughters, how are they involved in the news gathering process beyond just the creation of like pumping out stories? I like what you're doing the way we like what Mikvah's challenge does, mm -hmm. which is similarly, you're, you're bringing people into practice yep. And, yep. And, may, and empowering them in the process. Yep. I, I would say the thing, like we've been in the past, the things that Mikvah does, um, yeah, there are some parallels definitely to what City Bureau does in terms of um, engagement, equipping a focus on uh, equity, a focus on youth, uh, basically the, the, the future of journalism, like what, what can journalism really do? You know, what can it be? How much of this, um, you, you backed off storytelling as being the major thing. So I'm wondering if, if the journalism isn't the main focus, but just a tool, um, how much of your work is getting citizens to learn how to ask the right question? Uh, a, a good amount. <laughs> I'd say all three of the programs approach that question different ways. Uh, the public newsroom does it by, um, by, by giving people a space to work through the questions before they're asking them. You know, it's, we, I, we've seen like cathartic moments in the public newsroom where people aren't often, aside from school, people are out of school, you know, adults who are working, don't always have the space to really think about civics and to be in communication with other people who care. So those conversations, I think, are very valuable to asking the right questions. Um, the documenters program, we run trainings regularly. Uh, training, we're having a training on FOIA on the 11th with the Invisible Institute, actually. What's FOIA? What's that? What's FOIA? Oh, the Freedom of Information Act. Uh, how to file a Freedom of Information Act request to get He knew he just wanted to make sure our listeners and- uh, Oh, I'm sure, I, I know, I know. <laughs> That's one of the ways in which I think we're, we're equipping people, and preparing them to be able to ask the questions in the fellowship is where really um, folks are literally asking hard questions of uh, people in power, people in charge of uh, folks who are making change in the city. Did the activism of this year come to you, um, bring benefits to your group in the way of, um, you know, donations, frankly, and um, and higher level of participation? Well, let me think about that. Um, I, I, I think the, so I, I think the, the activism, the, the uprising, the organizing that are happening, mm -hmm. I, I would say like live on their own and touch so many different parts of all of our lives. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure I can correlate it to donations, but I do think it's been, it's raised level of awareness, probably nationwide, uh, and, and that might, correlate to donations in some way. Um, as far as membership goes, or just the participation, uh, I'd say there's a similar correlation there where the more folks are aware of these pressing issues, issues around equity and disinvestment and who is marginalized and why and resources, that's where City Bureau, that's where we, that's where we live. So once they're ready to begin asking those questions or if they're, I wanna ask different questions, we're saying we're here talk about how that relates to our information ecosystem. You know, all of these uh, big policy points, all of these big organizing points, all re relate to information and how we do it, how we create it, how we distribute it. So City Bureau is here as a place for anyone to come in who's interested in learning more about how to, um, how to build resilience in the information ecosystem. Let's talk a little bit about distribution. Um, when I was growing up, media was two or three newspapers coming to the home and watching the TV news or listening to the radio. Um, surveys show that people still get the majority of their news from TV, although I don't see much there, depending on what channel you're watching. Tell what about role, it. what tools are you using, what platforms to get your news or your stories out? Is social media more important than the broadcast channel, for instance? Do you use print? How, how do you get your stories and your news and information out? Right, right. I mean, City Bureau is lucky to be nimble. Um, when we started off with the fellowship, we, we never, we've never had a paper, never had a radio station, never had a TV station, uh, but we worked with all of those folks. So when we were creating stories, we still do this, when we, when we create stories, 
we're looking at early on at uh, not just who wants this content or like uh, who could benefit from it, but who is it for? Like who is journalism for? And so if we wrote a story about folks in Austin, we'd go to Austin Weekly News, you know, cause they have a paper. So we don't have to have a paper in order to find the right outlet to get the information out. So that, that's a big part of how City Bureau navigates. If it's a story that would do best on broadcast, you know, we might talk to Univision or, or we might talk to Can TV. Uh, if it's a story that will do better in a particular area, we find out who is already speaking to that community. Let's work with them. And oh, and social media. Yeah, we use social media. We we we've been we've been digging more into Instagram. Follow us on Instagram. Uh, we've got our, our Facebook. We've got a Facebook group. Um, we built out Documenters.org, which is um, a management tool for the Documenters program, but it's also a, a platform. You know, we all Documenters content is free for anyone to use on documents.org. So it, it is also a publishing tool. So we're, I think we're, we're, we're creative about how we approach distribution and are um, not too eager to be bound to anyone. Can you tell us what the next tool like TikTok or WeChat might be that us elders don't know about yet? I uh, think TikTok is interesting. We, we've, we've talked about that almost in jest sometimes. I'm not, I'm not sure if we'll actually, <laughs> if we'll actually do it, but um, you know, uh, Twitter just introduced this new Twitter fleets, which is basically TikTok on Twitter. And um, so we're, we're keeping up with how the, 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 the big tech, the platforms are changing, uh, but really trying to find our niche, you know, uh, if we're considering our communities, our, our audience, um, both, you know, the internal, the people who are participants and also the, the ones who are reading, uh, uh, we take our newsletter very seriously. Uh, that's where a lot of our content goes. Um, Instagram, Facebook, Twitter. Yeah. I, I think we're, we're really thinking around how do we, um, build our existing audiences before we start drifting off into like TikTok or WeChat or, you know, a text messaging platform, for example. Daryl Holiday, uh, if uh, you got a call from President-elect uh, Mr. Biden, uh, what are the three most important things that uh, you think he should do or watch out for? Oof. I mean, that's a hard one. We are in a Yeah, only three, Daryl, only three. <laughs> yeah. I mean, we're, we're in a confluence of so many crises right now. Uh, systemic racism, a deteriorating environment, ecosystem, uh, economic collapse, um, a, a pandemic. I mean, uh, those are four right there, right? That intersect, that these are, this is a complex problem to, to be able, it's basically four different complex problems. Uh, so yeah, I, I think those, those would be my, those would be the buckets I would start with. Uh, and then I want to begin thinking more around how do you connect policy to the ground level? Uh, I think the, the opposite tends to be true. You know, policy gets, it tends to get, you know, gets, gets made in a vacuum uh, by a select few. And then we, we hear about it. Documents do it all the time. Documents go to these meetings and it's like, where did this come from? You know, what are the origins of, of this decision? So making sure that anything we do is tied to the engagement of the public in these decisions to begin with. Daryl, are there any upcoming events you'd like to share or any, uh, give us some information how people can plug in and find you guys? Sure, sure. Uh, I'll start with one. If you are interested in being a documenter or learning more about things like the Freedom of Information Act or how to cover government, our next training for documenters is uh, December 2nd. And that'll be on FOIA, Freedom of Information Act. Um, our big uh, five year anniversary celebration will be on December 10th. And uh, that's what we're really pushing. We'll see everybody there. Um, you can find all of those on our website, citybureau.org. Thank you, Daryl Holiday from City Bureau for joining us, giving us some insights on how you're helping prepare journalists of the future, as well as civic leaders, I suspect, along the way. Um, we thought it would be appropriate to listen to an old favorite song of our family. Whenever it comes on, we tend to end up singing around the, the speaker together, Bound and for Freedom. 
Daryl, we hope we meet you in person next time. I, I do as well. Thank you all for having me. I appreciate it. Peace. Looking forward to those days. Let's listen to Pat Humphreys of Emma's Revolution on Bomb for Glory. In Montgomery and in Selma and the streets of Birmingham, the people sent a message to the leaders of the land. We have fought and we have suffered, but we know the wrong from right. We are family, we are neighbors, we are black and we are white. Here I go, bound for freedom, may my truth take the lead, not the preacher, not the Congress, justice i will raise my voice in song and our children will be free to lead the world carry on from a cell in pennsylvania from an inmate on death row for me i have the courage to expose the evil show from the courtroom to the boardroom in the television's glare So we are back with um, Heartland at Home, number 27. And this time we're with Dorian Perry Tillman, who is a Black Lives Matter activist at Loyola uh, University, our, our home school from uh, this radio station. Um, Dorian, welcome to you, um, to Live from the Heartland. I mean, what it used to be Live from the Heartland. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for being here. Uh, you're a brand new Chicagoan. You've only uh, been here a year? A little over yeah. a year? Yeah, just a year. Okay. And yet you found yourself uh, sitting on the street in Sheridan Road and uh, Broadway um, a few, uh, about a couple months ago. And for God knows, a whole week, 10 days, you guys were out there. Yeah, we, um, we, protested about 10 days in a row and then we had a couple other days scattered since. Mm -hmm. How'd that feel? It was a good feeling. Um, definitely a big sense of community when you know you're there with your fellow students and you know you're all kind of there fighting for the same cause. Um, it was definitely eye-opening for me. It kind of showed me that you know there were a lot of students that cared about uh, the Black Lives Matter movement and just that were like kind of willing to put themselves at risk to um, protest with us 
Why did you decide um, <laughs> to do a street blockade? You know, what reaction were you looking for? Um, so the original protest, we actually weren't even planning on going in the street. Um, we were planning on protesting outside just one of the Loyola buildings. And we didn't expect that big of a crowd size. Um, you know it was summer kind of um we had classes hadn't started yet and um most people aren't around campus because uh the dorms are closed so we had very low expectations but when we saw the crowd size we kind of were all like amped up and it just it just happened um pretty naturally we didn't really know what to expect after you know i'm gonna jump in here and uh katie happened to have been in the streets years ago and I just like her to share that with our listeners and share it with you so that you see a little bit of historical perspective about the role of Sheridan Road in demonstrations for justice and a better world. <laughs> well, uh, Dorian, it, we uh, shared it briefly, but in 1970, and I'm, I think the first time was maybe in 69 during the moratorium stuff, uh, Mundelein students took to Sheridan Road um, right there near where um, the skyscraper is, what we used to call the skyscraper. Do you still call it that? Mundelein no. Center? I call it uh, Mundelein now. Yeah, <laughs> okay, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> anyway, we all went out and it was all the all women's Catholic college. So it was a little um, eye, eye raising for folks to um, be stopped in traffic by these nice polite little Catholic girls who were handing flyers out to the ticked off drivers who then sort of had to decide, oh, is this worth my being stopped to talk about the war, to think about the war? So mm -hmm. yeah, um, I, when I saw that, that you all were doing it to, on to the next level, which was really sitting down in the street and stopping the traffic, I was like, yes, <laughs> yes. So what was it you were trying great, to do uh, a great in that moment and what reaction did you get from Loyola, or for that matter, the Loyola neighborhood? Um, so we, at the beginning of our protest, our goal was to get our school to recognize the Black Lives Matter movement because we had heard from like other professors and other administrators that President Joanne Rooney like had no interest in talking about like the Black Lives Matter movement, which was just kind of disheartening for a lot of us. Um, considering Loyola, you know, prides itself on like being for social justice and, you know, being a Jesuit institution. So our goal was to get people to, you know, kind of recognize that, hey, like Loyola might not be saying anything, but we are and we're going to, you know, inconvenience other people until they do. And um, our initial reaction from the school was just kind of silence. Um, they didn't really say anything about it. Um, it kind of took us getting arrested for them to start to make um, statements. They kind of realized that we weren't going anywhere um, for a while. But yeah, they um, they really didn't want to uh, kind of acknowledge us. Did anybody speak up on your behalf to the school administration, like other students or neighborhood people or? Um, we have like a pretty good like core group of students that like um, have been organizing and we kind of all, all like speak on each other's behalf. I also, I got to talk to a lot of people in the neighborhood, just like when we were marching or even like when I'd be running errands, people would recognize me and be like, hey, I saw you at the protest. Um, it was really great, you know, seeing that in the neighborhood, like they'd talk about how they lived in Rogers Park and like, you know, haven't really seen too many protests and things like that. Um, so, I mean, the overall community seemed very appreciative, which I liked. We've been living in this COVID pandemic, which has certainly changed college life. Um, in fact, the Loyola basketball team has been shut down because of uh, rampant COVID infection. I don't know what Sister Jean's going to do this winter, but um, how has this affected what you expected going off from Boston to uh, Chicago to go to college? Yeah. So you could go online. It definitely wasn't anything that I expected. Um, you know, I'm, I was supposed to be living in dorms uh, this year, but I instead got an apartment off campus, which – I definitely like the apartment living better than, than dorm living, but um, I'm a social butterfly. I like to be, you know, out and about all the time. So, you know, kind of staying at home and trying to stay safe has definitely been a challenge for me. 
also in terms of like protesting, it's kind of scary protesting in a pandemic because, you know, you put yourself at that added risk of getting sick. Um, and then, yeah, I don't know. It just, it's very different. Even like online learning, it's not the same. Like it's very different kind of getting all your information from a screen rather than being like in class with other people. What's it like in the neighborhood over there? I mean, uh, do you go to Archie's? Do you uh, miss the five guys? Um, do you get to run on the track? What do you? What's your life like these days? Yeah, I've I haven't been able to do too much, especially recently with the spikes. I go to the Common Cup Cafe a lot, or I did a couple weeks ago um, down by like the Morse area. Um, and me and my friends would do homework there, but ever since like the third wave's kind of been hitting, it really has just been staying home. Um, I definitely do miss the five guys. Um, it closed like two weeks after I got to campus too, which was so upsetting. But <laughs> um, yeah, I and I have a friend that works at the Archie's Cafe and I've been meaning to go, but I just, <laughs> just can't, which really sucks. Yeah, you gotta be careful. Yeah. What are rents like in the neighborhood now? For someone who's living off campus it's like it depends on how many roommates you have so like when i have one other roommate so for like two people it's around like 750 um that's kind of what we found like everywhere when we were looking um i know people paying anywhere from like 600 all the way to a thousand so it really mm -hmm. just depends and could i ask I mean, what music you're listening to right now what should we be catching up with yeah um I listen to a very like broad kind of, I don't know, stroke of music. Um, like a lot of my friends back home are very into like rock music and they like make music. So I listen to their band a lot. Um, That's one of my fun. Favorite, yeah. One of my favorite bands, AJR, uh, they're cool. I like them. I've seen them in concert a couple of times. I saw them in Chicago. Um, but then I also listen to like some rap music. Um, uh, a lot of revolutionary type music was my playlist for the summer. Just kind of like it would get me in the mood, you know, to go out to protests. Um, whether it was stuff that like artists were making this year in regards to like the 2020 protests or stuff from like 1990s with like the L.A. riots or like even before then. Um, I don't know. I was going to say, Dorian, give us a little sense of uh, any planning for future action. Uh, with Black Lives Matters, or progressive students at Loyola. Uh, you know, this is a long struggle. We're all in it. And we look to the youth. And we uh, we were very impressed when you guys and girls and others went into the streets. And, uh, we, you know, we like to stay on top of things and get the show lined up in the future. So what do you got planned that we got to look forward to? Yeah, so it's so difficult right now, just because, you know, it's like break and finals and everyone's really busy. But we do have a meeting with um, President Rooney coming up, which that's pretty exciting. Um, we met with her a couple weeks ago, like the organizers and other black student leaders at our school. And that meeting was honestly just very disappointing. So I'm hoping that she's taken the time to kind of like educate herself um, and, you know, get more familiar with everything that we're working for. Um, Hold your feet to the fire, Dorian. Yeah. We, we just keep, we keep adding the pressure and that's what kind of gets her to, you know, keep having to speak up because she, she thought she could wait us out, which was like her first mistake because like, <laughs> we're all young college kids. We have nothing better to do. We're in a pandemic, <laughs> like, you know, protesting was what we did for fun. I had so much fun in the streets. I made so many friends and it was kind of like the only appropriate way to go out. So we were all excited every day to protest. See what he just said, guys, <laughs> they didn't miss us at all. All of us who stayed home because we're old and we'd get sick. I, I've been thinking about it all all summer long because the, the numbers would have been so vastly much bigger if those of us who normally demonstrate had demonstrated. But you guys, you guys were getting to know each other. That's even better. I met That's some of my better. best friends, like some people I had no idea they existed last year, like at school. I met and it's it's so much better meeting people at protests because it's like we're both here for the same reason. So we already have something in common. And it's, I don't know, it was just great. I, I miss the streets a lot. They're still there for you. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to take a different route if I'm driving downtown. <laughs> well, Unless well, I'm going to park and cheer you on. Yeah. <laughs> well, we did have a lot of action on Sheridan Road a couple of weeks ago when the uh, results 
were announced the yeah. election results. I'm not sure if you were out or witnessed any of it, but yeah, there was we, uh, a lot of hooting and hollering and horn blowing. Yeah, um, it was a lot of fun. We actually protested that day in the streets too. It was uh, it was a good time. They had to bring the riot cops out for us, which was really surprising. What was, they what? Uh, they brought out the riot gear for us that day. It was it was surprising. Yeah. They being the Loyola police or the Chicago police? Uh, the Chicago police. Oh, I love uh, that. How have the Chicago police treated you? I think there were a few arrests. Yeah, so I was one of seven who got arrested. Um, it was uh, it was fairly premeditated. Um, that was like our ninth day in a row or tenth day in a row at that point. And um, they had actually spoken to me before the arrests. We were doing a chalk day where we kind of just drew chalk art on campus. And a uh, Chicago police officer came up to me and they were like, hey, are you Dorian? And I was like, no. <laughs> and they were like, yes, you are. Um, and they were like, we just want you to know that if we like the next time you protest in the streets, you're going to be the first person that gets arrested. And I was just like, okay, like, all right, we'll see. So we went out in the streets that weekend and sure enough, I was the, that was the first person. Um, we were in the streets and we were actually about to end the protest and, you know, go home. And I was kind of saying the final remarks as I do every day. And um, they started instigating stuff with us. So then we were like, okay, well, now we're not going to go home because you're, you know, causing issues, et cetera. So they bring out the paddy wagon um, and we kind of are just standing there and uh, they just kind of bursted through our line of people and all of the CPD officers started chanting my name, which was really weird. And it felt kind of like dystopian in a way. They just kept saying Dorian, 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 Dorian. Oh, so weird. It was weird. So I just kind of like blacked out and I was like, what is going on? Um, my friend wrapped his arms around me and they kind of like shoved him to the ground and beat him with like the baton. Um, so he has like some injuries and got like a concussion. Um, and they like arrested me and some of the bystanders like heard them going on the walkie talkies like, oh, we got Dorian, um, you know, whatever. And then they arrested six other people um, during that time period um one of them one of the other black students um he was actually on the sidewalk and he got pulled into the streets and like thrown to the ground and arrested um so yeah it was it was a rough day we spent about 10 hours in jail um they they waited a really long time to process us um they that. yeah they just kind of want us to like sit they there take the 24th uh, district over in clark street or where did they take you oh they took us a little bit far i think they took us to 19. it was like fairly oh, like town hall is that town hall michael no 19th Maybe. district no 19th district I, I think it's either uh uptown or or belmont yeah they took us somewhere they didn't take you to the local place no they didn't take us they brought our belongings to the local place like we got out and then we had to like yeah. travel to the different places to get all of our stuff it was sure. yeah they're really mm -hmm. terrible yeah, it was it was terrible. Luckily, um, so far, four out of the seven of us, myself included, had our charges dropped. Um, they tried to prosecute us, but the judge kind of threw them out because um, it was just stupid. Because like I only got charged with um, like obstruction, like of traffic, like it's like a jaywalking charge, pretty much. So like, because I I didn't really do anything, but like there were others that had, um, you know, like resisting arrest and like obstruction of an officer, things like that. So we're just waiting for their charges to kind of be put into trial. Based on our experience back in the seventies, I'm immediately thinking about the rent cops on Loyola's campus who may in fact be off duty Chicago mm. police officers. And that's how they knew about Dorian or Chicago police department is following activists and Loyola, just like they did the red squad some things never change <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, well, welcome they, the police used to chase us around a lot and uh, uh they'll probably be doing that to you for a while and yeah. keep up the good work yeah. dorian perry tillman thank you so much for uh standing up and um good luck suffering through the covid campus <laughs> experience um sounds like you're figuring out a way to keep uh, busy and active anyway and we, yeah. we appreciate that, those of us who live here in the neighborhood. 
And keep uh, us posted. Keep us posted so that we stay up to date on your We ideas. look forward to meeting you in person. Yeah, thank you so much for having me. It was great talking to you all. I really appreciate it. Be well. Stay safe. All right. Thank you. Bye. Bye bye. Um, we have something good to organize um, about organizing to tell people about um, the uh, organizing progressive cities post Trump event is happening. Well, if you're hearing me on the radio, it's today, this afternoon, um, starting at 11 with Alderman Maria Haddon, Alderman uh, Matt Martin, Alderman Andre Vasquez. And it's being moderated by our good friend, Dan Biss. And hopefully if they talk about what they can talk about with that kind of title, it would be the subject matter of many radio shows to come. Um, organizing progressive cities post Trump. And we hope to get Daniel Biss back on the show. He's running for mayor in Evanston. Yeah, uh, right. That said, we want to thank our guests, uh, Daryl Holiday of City Bureau, uh, Dorian Perry Tillman of Loyola, a Black Lives Matter uh, activist. We want to thank Brian Meir down there in Brazil. We want to thank Jimmy Johnson for his Saturday afternoon musical shows. And of course, Susan Clark for her hard work, Lynn Orman for her contributions, and our intern out of Loyola, Luis Mejia. And, uh, you know, it is a revolutionary kind of a time we're in. So we're going to go to one of our favorite guys. That would be Woody Boone, This Land is Your Land, done by John McCutcheon. So do good in the world. The world needs all the good we do. All power, all to, power the to the people. people. See you next week. As I was walking that ribbon of highway I saw above me that endless skyway. I saw below me that golden valley. This land was made for you and me.